This is a revision video about the GCSE Biology topic of natural selection. It comes up in Paper 2 of AQA GCSE Biology and Combined Science as part of the final unit about variation and evolution. In this video, we're going to define the terms evolution, natural selection and speciation. We'll list the steps required for a population of organisms to evolve by natural selection. And then at the end, we'll explain why Darwin's theory was only gradually accepted although you only need this extra detail if you're taking GCSE biology, what's often called triple science or separate science. The Earth today contains nearly 9 million different species, but when life first began, all life forms were much more simple. All of the life forms and species that exist now have evolved over the last 3 billion years from these simple life forms. We call this gradual change over time evolution, and specifically in biology when we use the word evolution, we're talking about a change in the inherited characteristics of a population over time. By inherited characteristics we mean things that can be passed on from one generation to another, because they're encoded in the genetic variation. We're not talking about behavioural or cultural changes that wouldn't be passed on. Now if there are few enough individuals in a species, it's possible for the whole species to evolve together but most species have enough individuals that they're living in separate populations, and so it's possible for speciation to occur. This basically means where you've got some individuals of one species in one place and some others in a different place, and they're evolving in slightly different ways. Maybe you've got two populations who live on opposite sides of a mountain, and so they very rarely interact, and so each one evolves to become best adapted to the place where they're living. If it reaches a situation where, even when the two mix again, they can't breed together, or if they do breed together they don't produce fertile offspring who can have babies of their own, then we would say that a new species has evolved, and that's the process of speciation. Different scientists have proposed different theories for how evolution might occur, but we now believe that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection, which he wrote about in his book On the Origin of Species in 1859, has the most supporting evidence, and this is the theory that the vast majority of scientists subscribe to. Darwin's theory was backed up by years of experimentation and discussion, and linked to developing knowledge of geology and fossils. Natural selection is sometimes called survival of the fittest, because it's based on the idea that the fittest organism, which is the one best adapted to its environment, will survive for the longest. It's a long process that takes many generations. It's not the same thing as one organism changing its behaviour to fit in better with the environment, and it's not the case that any one organism is going to change its genetics in its lifetime either. This is a process that takes many generations. Natural selection has several key processes that need to occur in order for evolution to happen. The good news is that these are always going to be the same, so once you have the list memorised it makes it really easy to answer exam questions, which almost always take the form, explain how species X evolved trait Y by natural selection, and you just give the list in the same order every time. In order for natural selection to even start, there needs to be variation in the population, and that means that if you look at a population of clones, like a colony of bacteria, or a field of a domesticated crop that have all been grown from the same seed, then it's not possible for natural selection to act, because there isn't currently any variation. The most normal way for variation to arise is by mutation. The DNA sequence carried by an organism changes. This happens naturally pretty much every time your cells divide, and you have some really cool enzymes that are responsible for undoing the changes when they happen. But mutation can also be sped up by exposure to chemicals or environmental mutagens like some of the chemicals in cigarette smoke or the UV rays that you wear sunblock to protect you against. Most mutations are silent and don't affect an organism's phenotype, but some will lead to an observable change, and this means that there's now variation in the population. For instance, in a population of insects, there might be more than one colour. Because of this variation, some organisms have got what we call a selective advantage. This usually means that they're better at surviving. That could be because they're better able to get food, like if they're taller or faster, or it could be because they're just better at avoiding being eaten. So maybe they could be better camouflaged, or maybe they can run away faster. Because these individuals have a favourable trait, they survive longer, and not just survive longer, but they're able to breed more, leaving them to have more offspring. The breeding point is really crucial, and it often gets missed out. We should probably call natural selection reproduction of the fittest, not survival of the fittest, because it doesn't matter if you live longer if you can't breed. This is one reason why there are so many diseases that kill us in our old age. If a mutation means that a human will usually die when they're 10, then it will be selected against, because it will be very rare for anybody to survive long enough to have babies and pass it on.
But if a disease means you die at 70 instead of 80, then evolution can't work against it, because by 70 you've already had all of the children you were going to have anyway, and so the disease doesn't affect your reproductive success. When the offspring are born, they have a 50% chance to inherit the favourable allele that gave their parent a selective advantage. Because the parents with the allele have survived longer and bred more, this means that the number of individuals in the population with this allele will increase, and the next generation will have more of this characteristic. One really great and quite famous example of this is the peppered moth. Peppered moths have been pale and speckly for hundreds of years because one of the trees that they particularly like to live on are silver birch trees, and they have pale speckly bark. Now, every so often, a mutation comes along that leads some moths to be born with black wings. And because these moths aren't camouflaged, they get very quickly eaten by birds because they can be seen so much more easily. However, in the late 1800s, the Industrial Revolution happened and thick clouds of black smoke from the factories led all the surrounding trees to be almost black because they were covered in soot. Now, there was still a very, very small number of these moths being born that had this darker coloration, and now they had a selective advantage because they were better camouflaged than the white moths. The white moths were eaten at a much higher rate, and the black moths went from being super rare to incredibly common, because they were able to survive and breed and pass on their alleles to the next generation. It wasn't the case that individual moths changed their wings. This was a process that took many generations, and it involved the moths that had the darker colouring surviving for longer and being able to have more babies. Eventually, as new regulations came in and air quality improved, the number of black moths has decreased again. Another very famous example of evolution by natural selection is Darwin's finches, and I'd recommend looking them up. Um, they don't really look a lot like this, but I can't draw birds and I did the best I could. <laughs> So, before Charles Darwin wrote On the Origin of Species, he was part of a voyage on a boat called HMS Beagle to a series of islands called the Galapagos. They were basically going to this new part of the world that hadn't really been explored to try and find out about new plants and animals that nobody had seen before. So, the Galapagos Islands are these tiny distinct islands, and on pretty much all of them there are these little birds called finches. But each island has a slightly different kind of finch. On one island, the finches have very thin beaks, and on another, they have much bigger beaks. And basically, they're all quite different in this respect, and there are maybe 30-odd species. Darwin realised that they'd all evolved from the same species of finch that lived on the mainland. But there was natural variation in the parent population. There were some with slightly bigger beaks and some with slightly smaller beaks. And depending on what the conditions were like on the individual islands they'd ended up in, different birds had had a selective advantage. So if you look at my little graph on the right, these are just some made up numbers to give you an idea, but basically there were birds in the parent population with big beaks and birds with small beaks. And then on the islands, well, some islands didn't really have a lot of vegetation. They had lots and lots of rocks and open spaces and the rocks had crevices and in the crevices were insects. And if you had a very skinny beak, then you could get in and eat those insects. And so you would survive for longer because you could access the food and you would have more babies. Whereas on some other islands where there were lots of trees with really big seeds that needed a big beak to crack, then suddenly the birds that had the bigger beak had the advantage. And so they had more food, they survived for longer, they had more babies, and the population on that island evolved in a different way. So again, we're following the same process. We've got one ancestral species, there's some variation, then there's a selection pressure, so that's something that means some people do better than others, there's survival and breeding, and then that species is able to increase the number of alleles because they get passed on. Another really famous example of evolution by natural selection is Darwin's finches, and I'd really recommend looking these up. They don't look a huge amount like this, but hopefully you get the general idea. So before Charles Darwin wrote On the Origin of Species, he was part of a voyage on a boat called HMS Beagle to a series of islands called the Galapagos. They were going there to try and find animals and plants that hadn't been seen before and give them names and categorise them and take samples. Um, Darwin noticed that on the 13 Galapagos Islands, there were these birds called finches, and each island had its own distinct species that were quite similar, but had quite different beaks. Darwin realised that they'd all evolved from the same species of finch that lived on the mainland, but the natural variation in the parent population had been selected for in different ways, because the islands were quite different to each other. So on the island that had lots of rocky crevices where insects lived, the birds that had skinny beaks that could poke into the rocks had a selective advantage. They could get to those insects, they had a new food source that birds with bigger beaks couldn't access, and so they survived for longer and they had more babies. And on that island, gradually the population evolved so that they all had these long skinny beaks. 
On another island, there were lots of trees with really big, hard seeds. And so for the birds that lived there, it was much better to have a big, strong beak to crack them open. And so evolution acted in a slightly different way. If you look at the parent population, there are birds with beaks of all sizes, but selection happened in different ways on the different islands. So again, we're following through this same process. In the parent population, there'd been some mutation, so there was some variation. Then there was a selection pressure, something that meant that some individuals died and some survived. In this instance, it was different types of food and the way that they could be accessed. The birds that could get the most food survived for longest and were able to breed, and when they did so, they were able to pass on their alleles, and therefore those alleles increased in frequency in the next generation. We're going to look at one more example before you try answering some questions. If you're doing GCSE biology, then this is a named example that you're supposed to know the detail about. If you're doing GCSE combined science, then it's not a named example, but they could still give you some information in the exam and ask you to discuss it. And it's still an example of evolution by natural selection, so it's well worth looking at. Earlier in the biology course, when you did the infectious disease module, you would have learned that antibiotics are molecules that are made by fungi or synthetically in a lab that can be used as drugs for treating diseases. They kill bacteria, but they don't kill viruses because the viruses are basically able to hide themselves inside your cells so that the antibiotic can't interact with them. Some bacteria can be resistant to antibiotics, and that means they're much harder to kill. It doesn't mean that they're immortal, but it means it might take longer or more of the antibiotic to kill them. Evolution by natural selection happens much faster in bacteria than it does in animals and plants, and this is for a number of reasons. The first one is the short generation time. We've said already that evolution is a process that happens over many generations, but whereas an animal generation might be 20 years, a bacteria generation might only be 20 minutes, and so the whole process might take a much shorter time. The second reason is that lots of bacteria have a much higher rate of mutation. If you're an animal and you have lots of mutations, you get cancer, which is obviously not a good thing, but that's not a problem that bacteria have to worry about. And so for them, sometimes it could be an advantage to be hypermutable because it means that they can change very quickly and adapt to their environment. The third reason is that bacteria are haploid, which means they only have one copy of each gene. That means that any change in their DNA sequence that actually affects the sequence of the protein will be immediately obvious and it will affect their phenotype. And that's what the natural selection is actually acting on, your observable characteristics, not your DNA. Whereas if a human has a mutation, that will affect one gene, one allele, but you've still got another copy of that gene from your other parent, which is probably still working normally. And so it's far more likely to have mutations that are silent and don't affect your phenotype. The last reason, and this is really beyond the scope of the GCSE specification, but it's kind of cool, is that bacteria can pass on small circular pieces of DNA called plasmids to other bacteria without actually needing to reproduce through a process called conjugation. So if one bacteria evolves a trait, it can pass it on to its friends rather than just needing to reproduce. So what does all this have to do with antibiotic resistance? Well, normal, or what we call wild type bacteria, are susceptible to antibiotics. Antibiotics will kill them. So if you get sick and we give you an antibiotic, then one by one, the bacteria all die off. However, there might be in a population of bacteria, a mutation, and that leads some bacteria to be resistant. Now remember, this doesn't mean that the antibiotic can't kill them at all. It just means it's much harder. So now the person gets sick and we give them some antibiotics. The susceptible bacteria quickly die, but the resistant ones live on for a little bit longer. Some people at this stage will stop taking the antibiotic because they've killed almost all of the bacteria, so they're feeling much better, and they don't realise that there are still some resistant bacteria in their system. Now, free from competition from the other bacteria that were using up some of the resources, the resistant bacteria can reproduce, and suddenly there are hundreds of them. Antibiotic resistance is a real concern to the medical community. It can be quite easy for us to forget, living in a modern world, just how many people used to die of simple bacterial infections before we had access to antibiotics. But gradually over time, more and more bacteria are becoming resistant, and sometimes to more than one different type. This can lead to the rise of superbugs like MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which you might also have heard called MRSA if you watch a lot of House or you know, American hospital dramas. These superbugs are really hard to kill and they're really dangerous, so it's really important that we understand how we can stop other bacteria from developing resistance. 
the first thing that we can do is to limit our use of antibiotics. So that means not taking them when you've got a very small, low-level infection that you can fight off on your own, and especially not taking them when you've got a virus. Antibiotics can't kill viruses, so all you're doing is exposing all of the other bacteria in your body to a drug that they would never have met otherwise that they can now develop resistance to. The second really important thing is to always finish the course of antibiotics. So that means if you've been prescribed seven days worth, you take it for seven days. Because if you only take it for six, there might be one resistant bacteria hanging on for dear life, and it only takes one. The third thing is to use different antibiotics for animals to humans. So even though a cow and a human might have a similar disease, you give them different drugs. That's not going to stop any bacteria from becoming resistant, but it means that if they do, it doesn't really matter because it's not affecting the drugs that we can use in humans and in hospitals. The fourth thing is using narrow range antibiotics, not broad range ones. So saying we're going to treat this specific bacteria with this specific drug. General personal and large scale hospital hygiene are also going to help with this. And then the final thing we can do is that when one person has an infection with antibiotic resistant bacteria, we isolate them and we keep them away from other patients and from other people that they could pass the disease on to. Now that we've looked at three different examples of evolution by natural selection, let's see how we could answer an exam question about it. We'll do this one together. Describe how giraffes evolved by natural selection to have long necks. We know that for natural selection to occur, there needs to be some variation in the population. So we start off by explaining where it came from. DNA mutation occurred, or sexual reproduction might have led to novel combinations of alleles being created. This meant there was variation in the population. Specifically, some giraffes had longer necks than others. Then there was a selection pressure, the fact that the giraffes were going hungry. So individuals with longer necks could get more food. This is what we call a selective advantage. Because they had more food, they could survive and breed. When they bred, they passed on the alleles that caused the long neck to the next generation. And so therefore, the proportion of long neck giraffes in the next generation increased. Now it's your turn. Pause the video and see if you can write down six points that describe how polar bears evolved by natural selection to have white fur. So in exactly the same way that we had with the giraffes, we start out saying that there was either DNA mutation or sexual reproduction leading to novel combinations of alleles. This led there to be variation, and I'm going to specify that this meant that some bears had paler fur. Probably not white to start with, probably just blonde. Individuals with paler fur were better camouflaged and they could get more food. Because they could get more food, they could survive and breed. And when they bred, they passed on the alleles that caused the pale fur to the next generation. So the proportion of pale furred bears increased. And over several generations, this would have led all of the bears to evolve to the point where they had pale fur. Finally, if you're taking GCSE biology, you should be able to explain why everybody didn't immediately accept Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. There are three key reasons for this. The first one, which is the one that most people tend to remember, is that not everybody liked the idea that God hadn't made animals and plants in exactly the form that they were found on Earth. There's quite a famous cartoon that was published in which Darwin's head is put on a chimp's body. And this was kind of making fun of the idea that we'd come directly from chimps or directly from monkeys. The second reason, and one that's quite easy to forget nowadays, is that when Darwin first proposed the theory, he didn't have lots and lots of evidence. Nowadays, we've done lots of experiments that can show evolution by natural selection, but at the time these hadn't been done. So although he had this idea, he didn't have lots of evidence to back it up. The third thing was that we didn't know anything about genetics at the time. Even though early genetics work had been done, it hadn't really been published or read by the wider scientific community. So Darwin could explain what he thought was happening, but he couldn't explain why or how, because we didn't know anything about DNA or genes. So those three reasons meant that people were quite slow to accept his theory. Thank you for watching, and I hope that you found that a useful introduction to evolution by natural selection. If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos coming soon.